And I am going to turn it over to, um, to tonight's presenter, as mentioned before, from Cornell Cooperative Extension, and we'll get started. Thanks, Amber. Hi. Good evening, everybody. My name is Pauline Curley. I'm from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. I hope that you cannot hear my dog barking in the background, but if you can, let me know. She never really barks, but of course she has to pick this moment to, to start doing that. But I am going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see the presentation. I'm so happy you're joining me tonight. Okay, so let me start it from the beginning. And just let me know if you can't see the screen at all, but hopefully you can see it and hopefully you can hear me. If you can't, just uh, let me know, please. So good evening, and I'm so happy to talk to you tonight about the wonders of bulbs. And it's brought to you tonight by Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. We do have a diagnostic lab service available to you um, and a hotline. So the hotline number is 631-727-4126. And they're open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. till noon, they will answer that telephone. So if you have any questions at all about your plants, um, trees, shrubs, anything at all horticultural, you can give that number a call and pose your question to uh, either Alice or Sandra. And they're both extremely knowledgeable and they'll both be happy to help you. You can also, let's say you have something happening with your tree and you're not quite sure what it is. You can also send them emails with photographs of things if you're not quite sure how to identify a pest or a problem in the garden. Um, snap, a, snap a picture of it and email it over to Alice at aw242 at cornell.edu or Sandra at sib7 at cornell.edu. And they're, again, they're both equally as knowledgeable and extremely helpful. So it is available to you. And I do um, highly recommend that you, that you do that. I also recommend that you uh, become acquainted with our website, ccesuffolk.org. And on our website, you'll find all different events that are occurring. You'll find um, fact sheets um, about many different uh, things horticulture related. Again, whether it's about composting or even about bulbs, things like that, um, the website has just a, a ton of information on it. So I do recommend that you check that out. Um, here's what you will learn tonight. Here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about spring bulb choices, um, other season bulbs, meaning more uh, summer season blooming bulb, bulbs, site selection and planting. So there are lots and lots of choices available um, when it comes to bulbs. I mean, you look at these photographs here and there's pictures of hyacinth and tulips and alliums. And I know that in speaking to Amber, those of you that are attending tonight are, are going to have uh, received some bulbs. I believe she said alliums, uh, snowdrops and crocus. So um, you lucky folks are gonna, are gonna be thrilled when you see uh, what happens in the spring and, and early summer with those, with your alliums and snowdrops and crocus. So again, I, I have some beautiful pictures in here for you to take a look at. Just these are to give you ideas of where you could possibly plant things within the landscape. Um, here, there's some beautiful hyacinth and daffodils planted around, it looks like an oak tree. Um, so that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, one thing we do recommend is that you plant these, the bulbs in groupings. So it wouldn't be just a couple of, you know, uh, snowdrops, for instance, and then just a few uh, other things. Try to plant them in mass, like in big groupings, because when the eye sees that from a distance, you want to really get that impact of the, of the uh, flowers. So it's always best to try to plant them that way. So what exactly is a bulb? We're gonna go and go over what is a bulb. Well, first we're gonna talk a little bit about bulbs and how a bulb is a plant that has learned to survive by going underground during adverse seasons and storing food until it can grow again. So all of these plants called bulbs have the ability to nourish themselves. So they have that nourishment within them. 
but only true bulbs contain a complete miniature of themselves inside um, inside the actual bulb, which are fleshy scales that are modified leaves. So what are what is a bulb? It stores, again, its life cycle in underground storage structure, which is itself the bulb. So although we call many things bulbs, technically, you know, it's, it, it categorizes a little more than that. It's not just everything is a bulb. True bulbs would be your daffodils, and uh, snowdrops and crocus and things like that, uh, lilies. Corms, we're gonna talk about corms. Um, we have crocus here and gladiolus. Um, we also have tubers, potatoes and caladium. Tuberous roots, sweet potatoes and dahlias. Dahlias are considered tuberous roots. Rhizomes are iris and cana, um, but there are only several types of, there are several types of bulbs, but only one true bulb. So we'll talk again, we'll get into a little more detail about each one of those and what each one of those mean. So again, true bulbs, those are your tulips, your daffodils, your hyacinths, alliums, which are probably some of my favorite bulbs, muscari, um, Muscari is an early uh, spring bloomer, and it's that beautiful blue that you see, uh, lilies. And so those are most of those, those are your true bulbs right there. So except for lilies, which bloom in the summer, these bulbs will deliver color and beauty in the spring. And what more do we need in the spring but color and beauty after, after our winters that we have here? So it's just a beautiful way to usher in spring, to have bulbs just appearing exactly when we need them to, when we need that color, when we need that beauty. So spring flowering bulbs, they are planted in the fall before the ground freezes. Um, you can buy them at big box stores or nurseries, or you can go online to bulb suppliers. So, some of them are examples that we have are Brex, um, Van and Gellin or Sheepers. And they give, again, the landscape color before the shrubs, before the azaleas come out, before things begin to bloom. So I, I always just love, love, love that feeling of when I see some of the blooms that I've planted. You know, you almost kind of forget about them. And then all of a sudden you see those snowdrops appearing and you see the, the crocus coming up. And it's just, it's, such a wonderful way to, to begin the spring. So it's important when planting uh, bulbs to think about when things are going to bloom. So you always want to try to include some things that are early bloomers. So in things that will bloom in the early spring, things that will bloom mid spring, and then things that would bloom later in the spring or even into the summer. So for early spring, we'd have snowdrops and crocus, um, anemones, muscari, um, some mini daffodils. I, I had mini daffodils for years and years and years. Um, and then they finally started to peter out a little bit and I split them and then they came back again. Um, hyacinth and some of the early tulips. And then mid, mid spring, you're gonna look for more of the daffodils. Um, your mid season tulips will start coming up. Your double daffodils will start coming up, uh, fritillaria. Uh, then into late spring, you have your late spring tulips, long stem tulips, lily flowering tulips and your lilies, Dutch iris, and then allium giganteum, which I have a picture of towards the end of the presentation. Those are those really huge um, allium that are just tremendous. It shows a picture of a, I have a picture of a young boy with it, and it's almost the size of his head. Um, so I'm not quite sure which, which uh, variety Amber has for you, but um, rest assured, I'm, I'm sure you're gonna be uh, thrilled when they come up. So I have here from Long, Longfield Gardens, and I know this is a little bit difficult to see, but I'm gonna kind of go into it a little deeper here. This is a great guide that you might wanna to refer to when you're ordering your bulbs or when you're thinking about what you want to plant. Because what this does is this is going to tell you 
the the uh, tuber or the bulbs bloom time. And that is super important again, because you want to have sort of that one, two, three um, kind of, you know, impact where you don't want to have everything. You don't want to have all early blooming bulbs because then they're all going to bloom at once and be gorgeous and then die back. And then you'll, you won't have anything in mid spring or late spring. So you want to try to make it so that you know when these things are blooming. So just as your crocus are coming up, um, they're gorgeous and then they begin to fade back and then in will come your mid-spring bloomers, your anemones and some of your daffodils, your mid-season daffodils or your hyacinths. So you want to have sort of that beautiful flow of things blooming. And that's what a chart like this will help you to do is to see when these things bloom. Um, again, so that you can plan properly. You always want to have something in the landscape that's blooming. And we do this again, we do this with our annuals, we do this with our perennials. Um, so it's just important. So I do want to, to uh, bring this to your attention. And I believe that I do have, let's see, here it is for Longfield Gardens. Um, if you go to Longfield Gardens and you look for uh, bloom time chart for spring and summer bulbs, you will be able to see that chart. So um, I don't think you have to go through this whole, you know, uh, www thing, but just go to Longfield Gardens and look up bloom time chart for spring and summer bulbs. And um, I would keep that and always keep that in mind whenever you're planting. So here is one of the uh, flowers that I know Amber said she has bulbs for you. And this is called Galanthus and Galanthus is snowdrops. Um, and they are some of the earliest bloomers when it comes to bulbs. And there are so many varieties. Um, the one that you see on the lower left side here is sort of your average um, run of the mill uh, snowdrops that you see very often. But look at some of the other varieties. Look at that double, it's sort of like a double, um, bloom there. It's just, and with the, with the secondary greens and a uh, little bit of uh, yellow in there as well. It's just absolutely stunning. So with snowdrops, let's talk a little bit about them. Snowdrops grow best in sun or part shade. Um, it's best if you can try to plant them in groups of 10 to 25 or more under trees, sort of like what you saw in that first picture that I showed you where uh, they were planted around that oak tree. Um, you could do it around the base of evergreen trees to sort of, you know, spruce things up a bit. You can do it if you have rock gardens. They're absolutely beautiful in rock gardens, um, in borders, but they need time in the ground to spur on new growth and that flowering. So that's why fall bulbs are best planted. I mean, spring flowering bulbs are best planted in the fall because they do need that time um, to, to you know, get that energy to grow and, and bloom. And they, good for you, will frequently naturalize. And by naturalizing, I mean that they'll just keep sort of propagating themselves. And you'll find, you'll say, gee, I don't remember having this many last year. They just sort of um, just keep propagating. So uh, same thing with, with as you see, uh, you know, daffodils naturalized in a field, uh, they do the same thing. So. It's just wonderful to, to end crocus, same thing as well. Um, so crocus, I know that's another flowering bulb that I believe Amber has for you. These are the, you know, traditional, usually see uh, either yellow or white or, or this beautiful, stunning purple. I absolutely love those. Here are some other varieties. There's so, that, and that's one thing I want to really point out to you is, to try to go online and, and go to a good seed catalog uh, or a good uh, bulb catalog. I'm, I'm also talking about seeds as well because I'm also doing talks on seeds. So between my seed catalogs and my uh, bulb catalogs, um, but it's just incredible the different varieties that are out there. It really, really is. I mean, they're just, I mean, look at this one. This incorporates all three colors. You've got your white, your purple and the yellow in there. So they're just absolutely stunning. I did want to talk to you a bit. I don't know why my 
computer seems to be acting up a bit on me. But here's a gorgeous uh, area and it looks like the front of somebody's yard by the street side where the daffodils have naturalized and that's what they will do. They'll just keep naturalizing and they just are gorgeous. So we're, a lot of us are used to the classic trumpet daffodils. Those are the yellow with the large trumpet appearance in the middle. Um, but there are so, so many others. There's Narcissus Goblet, Narcissus King, Alfred Jumbo, Narcissus King, Alfred, Narcissus uh, Las Vegas. I mean, there are so, so many varieties and they're all just so unique and beautiful. And again, they'll have different bloom times. So you could get some early bloomers and some, some mid bloomers. And it's just a great way to, to uh, you know, have a varied uh, landscape. So other types of daffodils, triandrus, that's two plus flowers per stem. Those are beautiful. And the, the, they're downward facing. You could see the bloom turns downward. Uh, Jonquilla is a petite, smaller cup and extremely fragrant. So these are two just uh, examples of other types of daffodils that um, you could look into if you so desire. So again, um, early, mid and late bloomers, that's what you wanna try to uh, focus on. So here an early bloomer, Barrett Browning would be the example, mid King Alfred and late cheerfulness. And I mean, they all, even though they're all daffodils, they all really look so different. Um, and, and you could have them all together and they would all each, as one is fading, the other one would be coming up and just starting um, its show. So you can also grow um, bulbs in containers as many people do. Um, and they look absolutely stunning that way. So if you don't have a, a landscape where you wanna put them um, you can always put them into, into containers. You do have to be careful though about the overwintering. I mean, uh, it depends on the bulb. You do wanna be careful that uh, we are zone seven, seven uh, A. And that means that our first frost is somewhere around November 15th. Now that's variable um, because, you know, as, as the climate has changed, so have these, you know, last frost dates and first frost dates that we, you know, sort of adhere to. They're, they're very malleable. They're not really uh, hard and fast. So the problem with sometimes with having bulbs in containers is that um, they, they sometimes might not overwinter as well as they would be if they were in the ground because in the ground they'll be more insulated. So you just have to be aware of that. Uh, but they are absolutely stunning in containers. Uh, you can dig them up and bring them back in after they, you know, uh, peter out. So it's important to remember that for bulbs, that you don't want to, after they finish blooming, to completely cut down all the foliage. Because what that foliage does, it is, assists the, the plant with photosynthesis and it takes all the nutrients and whatnot and the energy that it gets through photosynthesis and it brings it back down into the bulb. And that's what you need for these bulbs to survive through the, through the winter time and to really um, give the plants the energy they need when they need it. So it's okay to go ahead when your when you're flower dies back to, to deadhead it, that's fine, but leave that foliage. Don't, I mean, it's, I know it's hard because if you don't have other plants around it, it doesn't look so nice sometimes. But what I've learned to do is plant other uh, perennials and other shrubs and things like that near them so that when they begin to fade back, you don't notice them as much. Um, for instance, in the front by my uh, driveway where you first come in, I, by my house numbers, I always love to have uh, bulbs there and I have all kinds of bulbs there. And when they start to die back, you know, it's a very kind of obvious spot as you're driving past, you want it to look nice. But I put uh, catmint or nepeta there right near them. So as soon as my bulbs are dying back and the leaves are dying back, my catmint or nepeta is starting to come up and it will cover that. 
So um, you do want to leave that yellow foliage alone. Um, again, interplanting with other annuals or perennials is a good way to hide that during that time. Um, you can mulch to keep uh, the temperature even and conserve moisture. And dig and divide every three to five years to increase the flower size. So sometimes people might notice that their uh, flowers are petering out and they're not really, um, you know, they're not blooming like they used to bloom. And that's because they need to be regenerated by being divided. And generally it's every three to five years to increase the flower size and increase the number of flowers that you're gonna get. So you would do this again, after all the, the, you know, the flowers have bloomed, they've died back, the, the foliage has yellowed. Um, you would do this in late spring and early summer would be the best time for, uh, for daffodils, for instance. Here are some gorgeous tulips mixed in with some hyacinth and uh, some other, other flowering bulbs in there. It's just incredible the combinations that you can make. I mean, I never would have thought of these colors together, but they're just, they're just gorgeous. So some single and double examples um, for tulips would be single examples, uh, Purple Prince. So I think that's what we saw in the earlier uh, picture here, one of the earlier pictures, this one here, um, Purple Prince. So it's a six petal flower. It's an early bloomer. So if that's what you're looking for in your garden, this would be a good choice for you. Um, double double uh, examples are gorgeous. They call them peony tulips because they, they're, you know, like you would see a double impatient. They're a double flower. Um, and so they do look a little bit like a peony due to the shape. They're sensitive to wind and rain. Um, you might wanna put them in a sheltered spot. They bloom later. And this particular one is called Angelique. And you can see here how they look like a peony. I mean, they're just absolutely stunning. Examples of some other tulip types. Well, we have fringe tulips, which have tiny cuts along the edge. And this particular fringe tulip is called Bell Song. We have, I love parrot tulips. Aren't they gorgeous? Parrot tulips. The edges fan out. Um, they have like a parrot plumage. And this one is called Gay Presto. Hyacinths. Let's talk a little bit about hyacinths. I love hyacinths. They're just the smell from, from far away. You can, you can smell it. Even when I, I go on my walks, I say, oh, there must be hyacinth around here somewhere. I can smell it. Hyacinth, there are about 20 types, uh, maybe more. They are, believe it or not, from the asparagus family. And we all know they're very, very fragrant. Um, some examples would be this one here called Blue Jacket. And then the one down on the bottom, a little bit more of a purplish hue is called Woodstock. How did we get to you, little Iris? I don't know how the Iris got in there. <laughs> Hold on one second, let me go back. I think my computer is acting up a bit. Okay, just bear with me, please. We're going to talk a little bit now about the Dutch iris. A Dutch iris is a mid-summer bloomer. Um, it makes a great cut flower, and it also has a, a relatively long bloom time. So a Dutch iris is as uh, beardless. Um, they call it a beardless tulip, um, and there are several other types of beardless tulips um, but I know Dutch iris is, is one of them. So here's another example of that. Here are alliums. Um, again, alliums really make, um, uh, just a huge impact in the garden. Um, they're just an absolutely gorgeous, uh, bulb. And I'm so glad to hear that you guys are going to be receiving some allium bulbs. Alliums prefer full sun. Um, and they bloom in late spring and summer. Again, it depends on the variety that you get. Um, there are so many varieties. 
Uh, like all flowering bulbs, alliums need a cold period to develop their roots and get ready for spring. But alliums, they do like some space, so you don't want to plant them too, uh, too close together, depending again on the variety. So um, generally about six to eight inches apart. So alliums are clump forming, forming perennials, and they will increase in number each year if they're properly looked after. And again, just like so many of the other bulbs, uh, dividing them every three to five years is a good idea because it helps to regenerate them um, and new growth to come about. So again, allium, they are in the, let me go back here, go back. They're in the onion family. Um, deer do not like them, so that's good. Somebody else was asking um, earlier which bulbs deer don't like. Uh, generally, they don't like uh, allium, but nothing is truly, truly deer resistant if a deer is really hungry. Um, and the beauty of allium is that they come in various heights, colors, and bloom times. And that's uh, this is an example of what you might see for alliums. Again, I don't know what you are going to receive. But there are all different types. I mean, uh, purple sensation you see here is, a, is uh, starts blooming in the late spring, um, and that goes to 30 inches tall. Um, Mount Everest, 30 inches tall. His Excellency, that goes to 50 inches tall. Um, Gladiator is a, is a huge one. I have a picture of that. Uh, Globe Master, another very big one. And they go until, you know, uh, throughout the summer, depending again on what variety you have. So again, here are some different ones. Uh, Gladiator is there in the middle. Um, Purple Sensation is a beautiful one. So there are so many different varieties. Then you have the smaller varieties. So it really, there's something for everybody. It depends on what you're looking for for your garden, where you're gonna put them. Um, but they really are a stunning, stunning flower. I mean, here's Purple Sensation. They're just gorgeous. Okay. Go back here. Here is the picture of Gladiator that I told you about. You can see this young man's head. He literally is almost, his head is almost the same size as that beautiful uh, bloom. I mean, they're, they're just stunning. And for, for alliums, what I like to do, and what we're teaching a lot of people to do, particularly with um, perennials, is to leave, leave the flowers be. I like to leave my alliums be because I think they look like sculptural. And I like the fact that, you know, they create seeds and the seeds will spill around and they're good for the pollinators and, you know, good for the... Uh, birds and whatnot will come and poke around and, the, and various pollinators. So that's why I like to leave them up. I think they look kind of sculptural and I just like the way they look. Some people like to get rid of them right away as soon as they're done blooming. But I, I even through the winter, I enjoy looking at them. I have a lower, uh, smaller um, variety. I don't have gladiator yet. <laughs> so bulb selection. When, when it comes to selecting bulbs, the larger bulbs will produce larger blooms. You want to check your bulbs for firmness. You don't want them to be uh, mushy because that means they're rotting. Uh, you don't want them to be soft. Um, and you want to make sure that they're disease free. Um, I've gotten bulbs in the past from, from various big box stores and had to return them right away because they were, you know, I opened it up and they were rotten. So um, there's all different reasons why that could happen and proper shipping or uh, packaging um, could be the bulbs got wet somehow, but you do want to be careful. You never want to plant a, uh, a bulb that is, you know, has disease or any sort of rotting, signs of rotting. So naturalizing, when we talk about naturalizing, naturalizing means that they're going to come back each spring in greater numbers. We touched on that a little bit. Um, so sometimes just a few hundred bulbs can quickly become thousands. And some good candidates for naturalizing include daffodils, crocus, snowdrops, muscari. This is muscari here with um, a white daffodil. So you see the white daffodil with the yellow center with the muscari. 
Um, so muscari is an early bloomer. So it has to be that this, uh, this type of daffodil is an early bloomer. Um, and by with care, they're, you know, carefree uh, attention to them. You don't have to pay much attention to them. They, they will kind of take off on their own. Dividing, well, it depends on the flower. So when they begin to get crowded, you're gonna notice sometimes your, your bulbs will stop uh, being as beautiful as they were at a certain point. And that could be for, for different reasons. Um, for me, I had to learn, I have some daffodils uh, that didn't, uh, didn't bloom this year. And the, the foliage was fantastic, beautifully green, but they didn't bloom. And I think the mistake that I made is that I gave them a fertilizer that had too much nitrogen. So when you're giving a plant nitrogen, nitrogen encourages leaf growth. So what you're looking for more so with a bulb is you want something that's going to focus on root growth. And that is phosphorus. So when we talk about NPK, the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium or potash, um, nitrogen is for your leaves. Um, so when you first want to get something going, yes, it's great. But for bulbs, you want to focus more so on phosphorus. Phosphorus, again, promotes root growth. And then later on, with let's say fruits or vegetables and things like that, what phosphorus does is it will encourage uh, flowering, fruiting and flowering in vegetables. So that's why phosphorus is important for, you know, also for tomatoes and things like that. And then your, uh, so there's nitrogen, potassium and the phosphate, the uh, potash is really, the potash is for overall plant health. So I was putting too much nitrogen down and so then the, the leaves were beautiful, but I didn't get the bulbs that I wanted. The bulb wasn't getting the nutrition that it needed or the phosphorus it needed for that root growth. So it could also be that they're overcrowded and they need to be divided and split. Um, a lot of these bulbs were develop offshoots or bulbets, they'll call them. So a bulb will, will develop little bulbets. So when you go to divide them, you're going to divide them where that other bulbet is forming. And then you also want to make sure that you get some of that root in with it. Um, if you don't get some of that root, it's, it's not going to work out. You need to have some of that root. So when you do this, when you, when you go to divide, you want to make sure that the foliage has died back. Um, and you would gently pry off those bulbs. Um, again, with a piece of the base. So make sure that you include the base in that. Arranging your flowers. So you want to plant them in mass. And that's because that makes the most impact. So you see here, you're looking at this beautiful um, landscape here. Those daffodils really catch your eye because it's a, it's a big grouping of them. Um, before I started the master gardening program, I used to think that, you know, oh, I'll plant one, you know, a little thing of uh, snowdrops here and another little thing, you know, uh, you know, 20 feet away over there. But your eye isn't really drawn to that, these little tiny, you know, uh, groupings. You want nice uh, masses of them. So you want to make sure you remove any debris, rocks and weeds before you do your planting. You want to rake any mulch to the side. That way you can put it back over. Um, keep soil on the side to cover the same soil to cover it after it's done. Um, a lot of people will put bone meal in the hole um, that they've dug, or sometimes they will put, um, you know, an all-purpose bulb fertilizer that would probably, again, be heavier on the phosphorus level um, because that's what the, they need for that root growth. And um, because for the bulb, it's important for it to develop that root growth. Soil preparation. So the soil should be loose. You should have good drainage, um, good aeration. Another good thing to do if you're going to go ahead and plant your bulbs is to get some compost. If you don't already compost and have it at the ready, 
Many big box stores sell them, local nurseries sell it. Um, it I would get some, some compost and put that in too. Um, with compost, you cannot go wrong. There is no place in the garden that cannot benefit from compost. Um, I just started composting myself a couple of years ago. I absolutely love it. Um, it really is a game changer because you can use it in every area of the garden, your trees, your shrubs, your lawn, um, and your bulbs when you're planting your bulbs. So it's going to add, that's what organic matter is. Your organic matter is your compost. Um, so it's, it's broken down organic matter and it's going to add nutrients to, to your soil as well. Um, the ideal uh, pH of the soil is a neutral uh, pH, which, which is a, between a six and a seven. Um, if you're ever wondering about what, you know, what the pH of your soil is and what the condition of your soil is, um, Cornell Cooperative Extension does do soil testing. And I do highly recommend that because then, you know, especially if, if you're planting anything, it's if your lawn, you know, vegetable garden, anything. Um, it's good to know what your pH is. It's good to know, you know, if does your soil need any amendments at all. Um, so it's $5 per sample. And we do recommend that you do it in various parts of your yard. So maybe your front yard and your backyard. And if you have a side yard, something like that. Um, but it's definitely worth it because they will tell you if you, if you need any amendments. Uh, so going back to the soil prep, you would dig to the depth for that type of bulb. So again, depending on what type of bulb that you have, um, it, you know, the, the package or the directions will always tell you. But for a rule of thumb, it's generally uh, three times the, the uh, depth of uh, length of whatever your uh, bulb is. So let's say you have a two inch bulb, you're gonna dig uh, six inches down. So the plant, you want to plant it, the bulb pointed up. Um, so the depth is the distance from the bottom of the bulb to the soil surface. The larger the bulb, of course, the deeper your depth would be. So you want to plant at a depth of two and a half to three times the bulb. So um, two inch bulb, again, six inches deep or, or even deeper. Add some bone meal. Bone meal, again, high in phosphorus. That's what you want. You want phosphorus for that root growth, for the bulb growth. And it's going to later on promote flowering. Um, spacing, be aware when you read the packages of whatever it is you're planting, be aware of spacing. Um, there are so many guides online, guidelines uh, that you can go to as well about looking up spacing um, and you know, especially if you know the particular variety that you're going to be growing. It's best to try to plant it before the first frost, which again for us is somewhere around November 15th. Again, that's extremely variable. Um, you want to try to keep those cool until planting. You don't want to keep them in a very hot area if you're storing them. Uh, here is a chart that I wanted to show you. This is through Cornell Cooperative of uh, Nassau County on their website. And this, they'll give you a chart. So again, there are many charts like this online that you could you know, visit the various cooperative extensions um, and look at their different websites. You can look at ours for Suffolk County, look at Nassau County. Um, so they're, they're all over the country. And so depending on you know, what you're planting, this will give you a general idea of what depth to plant your bulbs at. So for a lily, you know, you want to plant about 11 inches uh, deep and you want about 12 inches or so in between each plant. Um, for Narcissus, which is daffodil, that's the, that's the uh, horticultural name for a daffodil is Narcissus. Um, you want to plant them, you know, somewhere around anywhere from from eight to ten inches and six to twelve inches apart. So uh, this is a great, you know, uh, resource to have, um, a general guideline to have. But in general, when you buy 
uh, your bulbs, that it, it will always tell you usually planting depth and uh, how deep to plant and how far apart to plant. So you have your, your fall planting ahead of you. Um, you're gonna plant for fall to have your beautiful spring bulbs come up in early summer. But let's think beyond that. Um, you wanna go into uh, what can you add to your garden for dramatic color throughout the rest of the year? Do you want plants that will multiply? Do you have time to lift some of these plants and, and, and store them inside over the winter, which is what you have to do with a number of them, the elephant ears, the cana, um, things like that. So you do have to think how much work do you want to do? And it's really up to you. It's a, it's a personal preference. So some of the later bloomers, um, when do we plant those? Um, these are summer flowering bulbs. Um, so some of these would be like your hybrid lilies, your dahlias, gladiolas, uh, calla lilies, canas, um, and you would plant in the spring at, after the danger of frost has passed. Um, and they just add beautiful to, beauty to the garden. They're just absolutely gorgeous. So let's talk, we're gonna get into a little more detail about the difference between a, uh, a, a, you know, a bulb, an actual bulb, what is a true bulb and what is a corm, what is a, um, you know, a stolen or a rhizome, but basically a corm is a swollen stem base. And it's where the mass of uh, tissue is stored. So it's a mass of storage tissue. Um, it doesn't have visible storage rings when you would cut it in half as, it, as, a, uh, as a bulb would. And some of these examples would be like gladiolus, crocus, and cro uh, crocosmia. I'm going to show you a picture of Crocosme if you're not familiar with that particular one. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, it's red and it's a later bloomer, uh, later summer bloomer. And um, it's on my radar <laughs> for, for this upcoming year. So some examples again, um, Corm, Cro uh, Crocosmia, here's Crocosmia. And it's just so pretty. Um, someone uh, in the neighborhood has it. And um, it just catches my eye every time I see it. And I just had to look into a little bit more. And this is what it is. And I can't wait to uh, include it in my, in my garden. The great thing about it is hummingbirds love it. It's a perennial. And this particular one is called Lucifer. Gladiolus. You want to plant these in the spring. Um, three to five weeks it takes for them to sprout and 70 to 90 days to bloom. So they need, they need a while to, uh, to get going. And this particular one is called orange. So uh, here are some two different pictures of uh, the gladiolus. Here's another one with uh, different ones all together, different colors. And they're just absolutely stunning. They make an incredible cut flower. Tubers. Uh, what are tubers? So these, these are two pictures here. These are anemones on the top and then on the bottom, uh, caladium. So these are buds scattered over a tuber surface. They had buds scattered over the, the tuber surface. So roots and shoots will develop from, from the buds. It does not have a basal plate like you would see on a bulb. So a bulb is that basal plate um, at the bottom of the, of, the, uh, of the bulb. These do not have that. The tubers and the rhizomes don't have basal plates. Um, it does not have a protected covering like a regular true bulb does. So some examples are oxalis, anemones, uh, potato, and again here at the end, uh, at the bottom, caladium. And caladiums are tropical and they like deep shade. I have, I have a, a tremendous amount of uh, sun on my property, but I'm trying to figure out where I can put them because I just love these. Um, they are so beautiful. And I have another picture of them here. 
they come in such varied colors and they really, really are just beautiful. So you could grow them, you know, also in pots as well. So you'll see them a lot over the summer in, in uh, shady areas and pots with begonias and things like that, shade lovers. Then we have the tuberous roots. So these are uh, thickened roots, hold the food source for the plant. So an example of a tuberous root would be a dahlia. Dahlias are tuberous roots. So um, also your tuberous begonias, sweet potato, and daylilies. Those are all to go under the category of tuberous roots. And you can divide these at the time of planting. Um, but you do want to dig them up after the first frost, not the uh, daylilies, but the dahlia you want to dig up after the first frost to store over the winter. So dahlias, we're going to talk a little bit about, look at that top dahlia with that little girl. They call those dinner plate um, dahlias and it's bigger, literally bigger than her head. So you want to plant your dahlias uh, in the spring, mid April through uh, latest mid-June, about three to four inches deep with the eyes facing upward. So the dahlia uh, tuber will have eyes on it and you have to make sure that those eyes are facing upwards. And you wanna again, plant as clumps with about 24 inches between those clumps. And it's important with, with dahlias to provide them with support um, to keep them healthy because if they're falling over all the time, they're gonna be apt to, to get diseases. Um, and they need about six to eight hours of sun per day. Now, since we are zone seven, we would have to dig those up. Um, so zone seven or lower, usually required to dig them up. And you would dig them up before the first hard frost. Um, again, the first, fro the first frost date is November 15th. The first hard frost, that's hard to say, but you do want to get them up and out um, best before the first light frost, um, just to be sure, because once you have the frost, that's it. Um, you want to store them in a cool, dry area that does not dip below freezing. And they will never fail to please. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been out to the Dahlia Garden at uh, Bayard Cutting. They have a beautiful one out there, as well as one at Planting Fields. Um, Arboretum uh, as well. And they're just so varied in the uh, shapes, sizes, and colors that they come in. Uh, absolutely magnificent. So digging and storing, um, some will to tolerate zone six to seven winters. It depends. It depends on what type of a winter we have. Um, it's anybody's guess. So when the leaves begin to turn yellow, um, you use a spading fork to lift and you want to be very careful when you're, when you're lifting those um, to not be breaking them up too much. And when you store them, you want to store them uh, ideally in a little bit of peat moss or in a, a uh, mesh type bag. You want to make sure that they're not touching and that they have um, enough air circulation. Uh, a good place to store them would be like a cool dry basement or a cellar. Um, I, I'm not so sure about a garage. Uh, you know, it depends on how, you know, uh, temperature controlled your garage is. Um, you want to discard any bulbs or any tubers or anything that look decayed. Anything that looks diseased or decayed, you want to kind of throw that out or, or cut it out. If you can possibly cut it out, you can try it because diseases will enter through, you know, cuts and, and decayed parts of the, of the bulb or the tuber, and you don't want that. Rhizomes. So as some examples of rhizomes would be irises, lily of the valley, uh, canis. And rhizomes can be a blessing and a curse depending on what, what it is. For instance, a lot of our, you know, very bad, uh, Invasive plants are, are uh, rhizomes. For instance, Japanese knotweed is a rhizome. But for an iris or lily of the valley, um, it's a good thing because you want you would want it to um, because they tend to kind of you know uh, proliferate 
And for those plants, it's, not, it's, it's a good thing. For the Japanese knotweed, not so good. Um, so rhizomes are plant stems that grow horizontally under the soil. Um, Lily of the Valley, you can plant in pots um, within the ground to keep them from taking over because Lily of the Valley can become quite invasive. Um, so you do wanna be careful with that one. Uh, German bearded iris, we'll talk about German bearded iris. So the deer do not like them. Well, that's a good thing. They are absolutely beautiful. And there's so many varieties, so many colors. Um, the variety is just uh, endless. Let me go back here because I do have something that I wanted to share with you. So for the bearded iris, rhizomes of bearded iris should not be completely covered by the soil. So you want the upper half of that rhizome to be able to get the sunshine on it because that's how it's going to be able to produce its blooms. So you don't want the rhizome of the bearded iris to be completely covered by the soil. Iris rhizomes that send out bulbs for new iris will not rebloom. So they're constantly sending out bulbs for new, uh, new blooms. So the one that has sent it out already has already bloomed, it, that one is not gonna bloom again. So that's why it's a good time to, a good idea to divide them every three to five years. Um, you can divide any time after flowering until uh, late August or so. And as, as we're heading into fall and winter, you definitely don't wanna divide because the plant at this point is, is saving up and storing up its energy. And the plant is gonna need that to survive on that stored up energy. So you don't wanna be um, disturbing that in any way. So we are nearing the end of our talk here. Um, two books that I wanted to recommend to you are Bulbs for All Seasons by Kathy Brown and Gardening with Bulbs, a Practical and Inspirational Guide by Patrick Taylor. And these are two great books. Um, I know your library is, is you know, a fabulous resource for you. Um, I'm sure they have plenty of books on bulbs as well. Um, and if, if any particular book you want is not available, they're always so helpful and willing to get it for you. Um, so Brex is also a great uh, resource as well for concepts, uh, for designing, landscape designing with bulbs. So I would recommend going to the Brex website and checking that out. Um, and CCE Oneida has a good fact sheet on flowering, gardening uh, bulbs and tubers. Again, so many of these different Cornell Cooperative Extensions, they're all over the country. So um, it's good to kind of see what else is out there. Um, and then there's another one here, Chimong, uh, Cornell edu resources. Um, but uh, Cornell is chock full of, uh, of fact sheets and different things like that, growing guides. And I uh, wanted to mention you, to you too, YouTube is also a great source um, to go on and to learn, you know, tutorials about um, bulbs and Forms and rhizomes and that kind of thing. So I am going to go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen and see if anybody has any questions for me or if they want to unmute themselves. I'd be happy to um, see how I can help. Let's see here. We have something. Um, Yes, so somebody's asking here, if you plant different bulbs to stagger, uh, Sarah's asking this, if you plant different bulbs to stagger when they bloom, can you plant them near each other? Yes, you can plant them near each other. Just go, go according to the guidelines of what the package is telling you. So um, you don't wanna crowd them, you know, put them in the same hole or within an inch or two of each other. But if you wanna plant heavily, then, you can do that, just, you know, um, 
they can be near each other. Yes. And that's kind of the idea too, is, is when one is fading, the other one is sort of coming up. So just try to go according to the package directions on spacing. Um, Snowdrops are out of stock, says Amber. Okay, crocus tricolor, those are gorgeous. Um, the alliums look a lot like a wild onion flower. Yes, that is the, uh, because they're from the same family. They are in the onion family. And that is why if you have ever had your scallions or your chives or uh, anything like that go to seed in your garden, that you, the flower, and that's, that's the flower. Um, so yes, that is, they are from that family. Yeah, um, we have chives in the seed library and I let them all flower and they're just beautiful. So even if you don't love chives, but you just want to see yeah, them flower, absolutely. like it, it's great. So you could always pick up some chives from the seed <laughs> library and give it a try. There you go. And chives, the first year, they will not flower for you. They're a biennial, so it, they will flower the second year. Um, so you can enjoy your chives one year and then, you know, um, enjoy the flowers the next. What I usually try to do is plant when I plant the chives is I have a bunch for me and then a bunch I let go to seed for the pollinators because the pollinators absolutely love them. They love them. Um, so which bulbs can stay in the ground over the winter? Sarah is asking. So that would be, um, a lot of the a lot of the true bulbs you you know uh, that we had spoken about the um, tulips and your daffodils and your snowdrops um, crocus can stay in the ground hyacinth the grape hyacinth muscari um, all of those can uh, it's just when you get to ones that are more tropical. Um, you know, like dahlias, for instance, are originated in Mexico. So they're used to warmer temperatures. And that's where it gets a little murky with us being in zone seven, because the zones are kind of, you know, <laughs> they're really, it's, it's hard to, to know. So zone seven is the usually the cutoff. So anything zone seven and below, they recommend pulling up like the dahlia. Um, but zone eight and above you can keep in the ground. Um, Deborah and David, thank you so much for coming, Deborah and David. Um, Catherine says, you mentioned digging up dahlias after the first winter. Does that mean you can leave them in the ground after they're a year old? Um, no, I don't think so. What other bulbs aside from allium chives are good for the pollinators? I mean, they all, they all love them. Um, but especially um, allium and chives. Um, I mean, they, they, they love all of them. Um, so anytime you're planting, you know, bulbs or tubers or any of these things, the pollinators will love it. Um, but in particular, uh, they, they really love allium. They really go after it. Um, something that is not a, a bulb, but is a great pollinator plant that I planted this year in, in my garden is anise hyssop, A-N-I-S-E-H-Y-S-S-O-P, anise hyssop. And it's a flowering, I guess that it's considered an herb. Um, and it was used a lot for medicinal purposes and to make teas and things like that. It smells like uh, licorice. And it my 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 plants in my vegetable garden went gangbusters because I planted them, the anise hyssop, right in the same garden bed as I planted my zucchini. So, um, I mean, there, anything you plant is going to be good for, for, uh, for the environment. It's going to bring in pollinators. Uh, you have Lily of the Valley, says Michael. The only problem is they're taking over everything. Yes, because they're rhizomes. Um, how do you stop them? Uh, unfortunately, Michael, the only way to stop them is to pull them up. You got You have to get in there, pull them out, pull them out, because they are just going to keep growing. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, rhizomes can be good and bad. Um, that's one of the bad things about it is that they grow like that um, and they can become invasive. And that's why if you do want to have something like Lily of the Valley, you, you might want to put it in a pot and then put that pot in the ground. And then that way the rhizomes can't spread out. Um, and again, things, something like Japanese knotweed 
is is a is a rhizome and that's all over the place it's we have it everywhere and it's a noxious invasive weed so unfortunately the only way to really get rid of that is to get in there and dig it up and, and get it out um unfortunately there's sometimes no easy way to do that but you're better off doing it now and getting it out uh do a little bit at a time pull it out then then uh you know the waiting because it's just going to keep multiplying so, uh, so I think going back to Kat, Catherine's question, uh, digging up the, the dahlias the first winter, you do usually have to dig them up um, every year. Again, some people have said they, they are fine in zone six or seven. So it depends on where you have them and it depends on what type of winter we have. Some of our, sometimes our winters are very mild, other times they're brutal. So you're always safer digging them up and uh, doing that. So if anyone has any other questions for me, we are welcome to unmute. Um, gladiola bulbs. Deborah said, um, do gladiola bulbs need to be dug up before winter? Um, I believe they do. I believe gladiola bulbs do. I think that was also something where it's uh, on the cusp of being, uh, if it's zone eight, it's okay, but we're zone seven. So I do encourage you again to visit the ccesuffolk.org um, website. It's super, super informative and you can just look it over and see all the different events that they have and see all the different um, programs they have and the fact sheets and you will really learn a lot. Sometimes I go on it and I fall down the rabbit hole and learn something new. So I do want to... Um, uh, I did have someone raise their hand. Heather raised her hand. So I did unmute you, Heather, if you did have a question. I don't know if it was in the state or... Heather, you there? Feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm just gonna lower your hand, Heather. In so. the meantime, I'll, I'll answer Elizabeth's question in the chat. It says, um, her bulbs have not naturalized and they last a few years and then they peter out. Um, try digging them up and dividing them um, and seeing if, you, if that helps because sometimes if they're, if they're too crowded or if they get, um, it also, you know, the soil that they're in is, is super important because so many of these bulbs if the soil is too moist, they tend to rot. Um, so it can be a little tricky sometimes with some of them. It, you know, everybody's conditions in their yards and in their gardens are so different. Um, I would try to, um, I would try to uh, dig some of them up and try to dig in there and see what's going on with them. See, are they rotting? Could that be because the soil is too moist? Um, are they too cramped together? Do they perhaps need to be divided? So uh, give that a try, see if that helps. Because sometimes ju just dividing it will help a lot. Um, Heather is asking, I have a pot of calla lilies. What do I do with them? Last year I kept them in the house and put them out. They do not flower. Sound is not working on my computer, but I can read the transcript. Okay, thanks Heather. Um, calla lilies I'm not as familiar with. This is an instance where I might refer you to the diagnostic um, hotline. Um, it, it could be, you know, a whole host of different things. Um, you know, they didn't flower. So I don't know what the conditions were in the house that they were in. Did you have them in a porch? Were they in sunny condition? So this is one of the situations where I would recommend the diagnostic lab because what they can do is you can send them a picture of, of uh, your plant and you can say, hey, this is what I did with it. This is what's happening. This is what it looks like. And they can kind of look at it and see and get a better idea of, um, of what might be going on with your plant and lead you in, a, in the right direction. Um, again, they have now, they're so incredibly knowledgeable about everything. So I would definitely recommend doing that. Take a picture of it and show it to them and say, what can I do? Um, they might you know, tell you to pot it up. They might tell you to, you know, uh, divide it. They might have you 
add some phosphorus. So I, I'm, it's hard for me to say without um, kind of knowing what the situation is. But I do recommend utilizing that diagnostic uh, lab service. They are really excellent. I've, I have call them myself. Um, so if there are any other questions, you can feel free to unmute. And um, I just want to encourage you to, to, you know, if this is your first time planting bulbs, or even if it's something that you want to branch out and plant something different, go for it. And um, just, you know, really uh, make sure you, you have as much knowledge as you possibly can about that particular plant. And, um, you know, you learn by doing, uh, and that's really the, the way to, with gardening, as with so many other things. With gardening, we learn by doing. And, and sometimes when we make mistakes, um, they're, they're not just mistakes, they're, they're learning opportunities for us. I know at least I speak for myself. So um, it's fun to experiment, try something different. Try a fritillaria or uh, you know, something, something that you've never planted before. Um, Lily of the Nile or something like that. Um, and, and be, be willing and open to experiment with it. So uh, if there are, are not any other questions, I just wanna thank everybody so very, very much for being with me tonight and um, Amber for hosting me this evening. And I do hope that I can come back again and uh, talk to you again. Absolutely, thank you so much for your time. I learned a lot and I think everybody else did. And thank you so much. Hopefully you're back for another program with us at some point. Uh, so. I would love that. Thank you so much and okay. thank you everybody. Happy okay, going. and I'll be in touch everybody about the bulbs as soon as they come in. I do not have them in the library yet. But as soon as they ship, I will be contacting everyone, I promise. So uh, stay tuned. Wonderful. Thank you. Happy, happy planting. <laughs>